This also offers a potential for revolutionary transformation um, and uh, the need for solidarity. Uh, and that's particularly apparent around the world today, you know, where heat waves are cooking people who can't afford to get into air conditioning. Um, so can, can I offer a yes but here? I mean, clearly the, everything that everybody just said is true. Um, the, with the Trump administration in power, the importance of states, and in particular, you know, states with big tax bases like California, New York, to kind of model new policies and experiment with new policies is huge. But the biggest problem with climate politics this whole time has been the neglect of the nation state, the, the huge problem with the entire UN process. The nation state is the only level that is able to mobilize investment in a very, very significant way and cope with the fact that there are massive regional inequalities in every country. Like I'm, you know, I live in Pennsylvania now and Pennsylvania has no capacity to do anything resembling a Green New Deal, whether a good version or a bad version. All, what, can, what it can do is it can find good ways to spend federal money if that comes up. And so I would say in the US, the single most important thing that could happen is for a left democratic candidate in, running in 2020 to have a climate plan in infrastructure plan and jobs plan that are all the same plan. And the ability there to take something like an Obama-style stimulus a bit bigger and to direct that, that money that then gets spent locally with local accountability in a smart way, that is how you like, achieve a pivot in the US. You know, in the original Obama stimulus, tens of billions of dollars for high-speed rail, nobody has seen that. If that money had gone into electric buses, everybody would be riding one, biking behind one, walking next to one, driving you know, next to one, not able to hear it. Uh, and with a huge benefit in terms of jobs, street quality, transit, et cetera. So it's the local uh, you know, control over federal money that I think is going to be where we start to see a pivot to real scalable action. Well, let's not uh, avoid the answering the, the, the implications of your, of your question there. What does Bernie Sanders have? Has he put forward a plan that's sufficient? In the last Democratic primary, the best plan came from somebody called Martin O'Malley. <laughs> He had the best plan. God. Um, so, Not good. so I think Sanders can do better. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I think I think things are things. You know, he's, I think he's on the road to doing better. Um, you should get a one pager together. Uh, <laughs> yeah. th um, I'm sure it, it, PDFs. <laughs> one one issue that that. Uh, these comments have brought up is the question of like who is engaged in what we might think of as climate struggles. And often on the left you hear about what are called frontline communities engaged in frontline struggles, uh, places like, struggles like Standing Rock. But for you all, what defines the front lines? And do we need to expand that framework so that it includes things like urban water drinkers in Cuenca, Ecuador, and uh, formerly incarcerated solar panel installers in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles, and, and housing activists in Crown Heights. How should we think about, about where the front lines are and who's fighting on them? Well, I mean, I think because of the, the way that our entire economy is now like kind of dependent on fossil fuels, I, I think every place is basically a front line. Um, and there's like, you know, there's just like no place and no issue that isn't going to intersect in some way with a climate crisis. Um, uh, even if it isn't now, it, it will. And I think like changing climate, like rising sea levels or rising like heat waves, like that's gonna exacerbate many, many of the problems that already exist. Um, or even things like when, for the climate movement, like in urban spaces, there, there's a lot of talk about like greening neighborhoods. Um, and that's a good thing, like we should, you know, all, it's good for us to all have more green space, it, it can like cool down cities, um, but at the same time it also like, uh, you know, it can make a neighborhood much more attractive to the real estate industry. And that's something to be like very cognizant about, um, that we can't have, um, it's not enough for us to just like talk about greening an urban space. It has to happen in concert with like, like an affordable housing strategy or program. Um, and so I, like everything, I think, has to become a climate issue, basically. Uh, Daniel, you write about people, I think the term you use is like accidental climate activists, and that is definitely in line with this idea that the climate struggle is everywhere, but it seems like for it to be done politically right, the climate activists have to be more than, than non-accidental, ideally. 
That's right, yeah. So, you know, I, I find in my research on Sao Paulo and New York, I make this argument that housing movements defending affordable density against gentrification are the people who are promoting the lowest carbon vision of the city currently on offer. That, that if the fight against gentrification is the fight for climate justice. Um, to find out, you just have to follow the carbon, and what you find is that affordable density in well-connected neighborhoods like Crown Heights, under assault from gentrification, which ends up reducing residential density, nine times out of 10, um, and it's not just a defense of affordable density in terms of inhabitants per building or inhabitants per room, but what it's about is defending a long-term vision of the city built up by unions, racial justice groups, community groups, where public goods are prioritized over private consumption, schools, uh, daycares, libraries, you know, basketball courts, all the kinds of things that enable low carbon leisure and low carbon life in the city. Um, as Mike Davis says, the cornerstone of the low carbon city is the priority of public uh, affluence over private wealth. So then the question is, yeah, isn't it ideal if these groups embrace the climate label? And it's, it's happening. It's happening in Sao Paulo. It happened, a uh, housing movement led by you know, women of, working class women of color, more and more talking to its members about climate justice. In New York City, you see a group like Align, which is developing a proposal to dramatically reduce uh, emissions through energy efficiency in big New York buildings, working with labor unions, and specifically uh, a, a legislating so that the retrofits don't give landlords the opportunity to raise prices in regulated apartments. So you are seeing kind of around the world the shift from housing movements that don't talk about climate change and see environmentalists as elitist enemies to instead sort of forming a partnership, what I call democratic ecologies, which is kind of a counterweight to the Bloomberg style elite ecologies. So that's good news, but again, absent major infusions of investment, I worry that that kind of rhetorical shift and that kind of intellectual shift starts to fritter away when communities end up again playing defense. So you need a combination of organizing and alliance and investment to really deepen um, that new politics. But the fact that it exists, the fact that the people who are fighting to, to live a decent life are also climate protagonists um, and that they're growing and getting more powerful all around the world, that makes me wake up every morning feeling good about our chances of fighting back climate change. Oh, and we'll get to the politics of optimism, which is one of your... Uh, pet causes later, for sure. <laughs> Can't wait. Glad I could bring one pet into this room. <laughs> uh, Thea, you're, you're involved in a frontline climate struggle in Rhode Island that might not appear to be that mm -hmm. at first blush with Providence DSA. It's against National Grid, the sh private shareholder-owned utility that runs the show in the small state. Um, it connects the needs of working class consumers, questions of the social ownership of of wealth and obviously renewable energy and climate change. I, explain a little bit about this campaign that you're working on and what lessons you think it might offer for eco-socialists organizing elsewhere. Um, so the campaign is guided by an explicitly eco-socialist vision to establish a publicly owned utility that would um, simultaneously democratize, decarbonize, and decommodify the energy system. And I've also started adding a fourth D to that, which is decolonize, which is to think kind of circling back to Ashley's point about racial capitalism, about the environmental racism that pervades citing decisions in terms of where LNG plants are, or where, where substations are. So kind of bringing that to the fore as well. So our long-term vision is we want a publicly owned utility that's democratically controlled and powered by renewables, um, but kind of again, kind of picking off on what Audrey has said about meeting people where they're at in the sort of 101 of community organizing, a lot of what we've been focused on in the short and medium term is affordable energy. Um, there's a shutoff crisis in Rhode Island. There might be shutoff crises in other states, but they tend to be sort of not reported because energy's not yet as politicized as it should be in the US. Um, tens of thousands of Rhode Islanders a year um, uh, who can't pay their bills, get their gas or electricity shut off. Um, meanwhile, National Grid, which interestingly emerged out of the utility privatization process in the 1990s in the UK, and then went global, and the US is one of its biggest markets. Um, it makes, I think, around $2 billion a year in its US business. And you know, meanwhile, poor Rhode Islanders um, that can't pay a $50 bill, a $100 bill, a $200 bill are being shut off. Um, so we're trying to address the shutoff crisis as a kind of 
moral claim and a kind of um, welfare rights, poor people's kind of movement type of strategy um, of informing people about their rights as ratepayers um, to not be shut off if they meet certain conditions, um, but also to organize them and educate them sort of more broadly about um, getting involved in, a, in an eco-socialist campaign. So we're kind of starting from that everyday material need, which doesn't immediately connect to climate for most people, but sort of using that as a platform to then talk about who controls our energy, who makes these decisions, why are they made behind closed doors, and how can we sort of open them up in an emancipatory direction. I want to just come back to the question of scale, um, because what you're doing, I, I think, is so interesting and exciting, and yet, on some level, it seems to me that given the immense challenges we face, as Daniel was pointing out earlier, we need very ambitious proposals on a, a national plane. Um, and in terms of renewable energy, I think that there are concrete reasons to think about scaling up. I mean, California right now, for example, is, is thinking about merging with other Western states uh, in order to deal with very issues of kind of unreliability of renewable energy. Um, but it's faced with a bit of a quandary, right? Because Californians have established some of the most progressive policies around energy in the West, and the states that it could merge with are exactly the opposite. So questions of sort of regional scale and how a kind of nationalization of the energy sector might play out are, are really thorny ones. And one thing that we haven't talked about so far at this point, which I think really has to be put on the table, is the role of unions, right? Because unions just convinced the Democratic Party, uh, the DNC at least, to back away from its pledge not to accept fossil capital funding, right? So, you know, there's sectors of the union movement which need to be uh, brought into the fold of a kind of radical climate justice movement, but um, they're not there yet, and it's for very pragmatic economic reasons. Renewable energy jobs don't pay as well as jobs in the fossil sector. So how do we deal with all of these very complicated questions? And they're less, uh, less unionized as well, right? Exactly. Um, not unrelated, yeah. uh, which uh, does bring up a question that I wanted to talk about, which is why the green jobs message has failed to catch on, at least as it's mostly been offered in its liberal iteration, why it's failed to catch on politically in the US at, at the very same time that the, the promise of uh, resurrected coal, making coal great again, which is really this like phantom limb of American prosperity, there's way fewer people employed in coal, they end in the green energy sector, yet green energy doesn't really, uh, has not proven politically persuasive to people, whereas coal, where very few people actually work, uh, was a key facet of Trump's election campaign. Uh, thoughts about why that is? I mean, um, my understanding, I mean, that's a great question, and, um, it's definitely, I mean, green jobs did not pan out as like a rhetorical device, <laughs> and maybe it will come back, but uh, everybody that you talk to will agree with that, and probably they started too early um, for the message to take on, but it is certainly true that solar employs, far, um, solar employs far more people than coal, and it's actually one of the less unionized sectors of the movement. But, um, so there's a guy in New York who works on these building retrofits with uh, trade, you know, trades unions workers, often thought of as more conservative members of the labor movement, and he's like, look, I don't call them green jobs, I just call them construction jobs. Like energy retrofits, he calls them construction jobs. Um, so. I think there are like various lessons to be learned from like the bad branding of that. I think it's also true that in many congressional districts, you have you know conservative Democrats or Republicans who end up going to bat for wind and solar, talking just in terms of like energy security because actually those jobs do have a political weight. So the question is an exact. I mean, the question really boils down to how can you create a kind of national symbol or a national story um, different than the green jobs one, where people understand that like retraining works, that this is like a real line of work, that it really goes on, that it sort of aggregates these like random regional stories. I think you're right that there is a weird way that Trump was able to turn the kind of coal worker into a metonym. I don't think any of us really knows how successful that was beyond a few districts, but certainly at the national symbol system, the um, solar worker just doesn't really exist. Um, something that's been pointed, you know, there is like an image on the internet from like 2008 of black workers putting solar panels on a roof in Oakland, and it's just the same image repeated over and over and over and over again. And there's something about that idea, which is a real idea, which is, you know, low, you know, like working class people of color being given jobs that hasn't been made real. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think there has to be more investment and there has to be some creativity in the message. You would have thought the message would have been more successful given that Obama initially chose a former Maoist to uh, direct his green jobs program. But uh, Audrey? I mean, maybe it was like premature. Um, it's like sort of a question of timing and Trump came in and, you know, played up on 
basically, I mean, it's a nostalgia, right, for the idea of like the coal, coal miner as a person that like had this like good working class job that was steady and unionized. And, you know, I think we need better narratives, honestly, around like green jobs, um, that they are also construction jobs or, I mean, I even, like I, I often think about in um, like the Canadian tar sands. Um, I talked to, about a year ago, I talked to this um, one young tar sands worker um, who's basically like a construction worker and he uh, was talking to a bunch of his fellow workers um, when he was like on site about, um, you know, they're all concerned that like renewable energy is this like big thing that's coming up and, you know, the tar sands are kind of like, they, they have this bad rap now and who knows, you know, what the oil economy is gonna look like. So they're actually all concerned about their futures. You know, a lot of these are like young workers in their 20s. And so they started a camp campaign called um, uh, Iron and Earth. Um, and it's basically, it's not like a radical program, but it's basically to push for uh, Alberta to like retrain oil workers to be able to work in the renewable energy sector. And it's, you know, it's compelling that it comes from these like oil workers. Uh, and, you know, I think their narrative, I think their narrative works and I think there, there just need to be like more of them out there. I think another piece, which is, um, I know Alyssa Battistoni has written about, and as well as others, kind of bringing an eco-feminist socialist angle to this, is uh, um, reconceptualizing green jobs beyond like the hard hat jobs, right? So thinking about care work, um, uh, work in education and health fields, um, and other sort of service sectors as um, low carbon work that isn't about producing things, but about caring for people or providing services or you know teaching uh, um, or caring for elders. Um, and that would be a big part, that already is a big part of what the working class is now um, in the US and would be a big part of what a green transition would look like, more of that type of work, of course, better paid and unionized and more valorized and respected. But um, I think expanding the notion of green jobs away from just you know retraining coal miners, not to downplay that, um, but, but to other sectors of the economy that are part of what an eco-socialist future might look like. If I could just say one other thing about the figure of the coal miner, which is obviously part of what you're saying, Daniel, this kind of macho nationalist rhetoric, which Trump takes pride in. But focusing on the coal miner um, the way that Trump did also allows him to ignore the kind of conflicts within different sectors of fossil capitalism, particularly the fact that it's uh, natural gas. It's essentially putting coal miners, um, as well as automation, putting coal miners out of their jobs. It's certainly what's leading to the shutdown of coal-fired um, power plants. Um, but obviously, liquid uh, natural gas is a huge problem. It's being touted as a transitional energy form. Um, there has to be a very strong critique of that, because the more of that infrastructure gets put in place, the more we're stuck with continuing kind of fossil fuels. And I think that's why um, the kind of frontline uh, act Activism against any new um, fossil infrastructure, particularly anti-pipeline um, work, is really, really important. Um, and I think we also need to think about um, kind of magnifying or ramifying the idea of the front line um, in terms of ways that we can support those kinds of struggles. Because one of the things that Trump has done is to criminalize um, any kind of environmental protest, to treat it as, uh, although this started happening under the Obama administration, but to treat it as a form of terrorism, right? And he's very much invoked the idea of energy and uh, national security. Um, and so we really need to fight against those kinds of notions of national security relating to energy, um, uh, at least fossil capitalism, but notice that Trump is willing to talk about energy and national security. I mean, he sounds very much like an eco-socialist on some level, right? He's willing to bring up that idea of nationalizing energy sectors. I mean, that's what his latest um, legislation is purporting to do. Of course, it's in order to prop up fossil capitalism, but he's put the idea that the market is not or should not be the determining force in the energy sector on the table. And I think that's something that eco-socialists should take up and run with. Well, so just one last thing. I mean, I certainly, I mean, the prestige of the market is not like exactly the world's most, you know, the happiest thing in the world right now. Um, so that's good for the left in its own way. The, um, I just wanted to pick up on, on something that Thea said um, to just add one more piece to the mix here. So green jobs, care work as a redefinition of green job, it is low carbon, that is fantastic. And then 
Another thing, if we look to Europe, Northern Europe as an example, although it has certain problems, is the idea of work hours reduction. That's like the oldest demand in the labor movement. And there is a, you know, endless empirical studies showing that people are happy to work fewer hours, often take home a you know, similar or slightly smaller paycheck, maintain very high quality uh, benefits in terms of health, education, and so on. And it seems to me one, one thing that the procurement power of the state can do with public jobs is offer more opportunities for people to reduce hours without giving up any benefits. In Holland, thanks to work from labor unions and feminist organizations since the 80s, it's been possible for workers to unilaterally reduce their work hours. So they take a small pay cut, but they maintain benefits uh, and all the other sort of benefits of employment. So I think we need to think about the idea if we're gonna have a job-centered uh, climate politics, knowing that we can't have infinite economic growth, we also have to think about transitioning the notion of a job away from earning as much as possible to a thing that you do uh, that's part of a rich life of spending a lot of time with people you love doing cool stuff. Uh, and by rebalancing the kind of social wage, uh, you know, as opposed to the individual one, that's something that can be done and you can sort of start bit by bit right away. Which, by the way, I feel like um, some of the like videos and the messaging that Kenyela Ng in mm -hmm. like Hawaii is putting out is like exactly about that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, more, uh, less carbon, more surfing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on, on that front, I think that one way out of the politico-ideological cul-de-sac that we've been trapped into is, and that Kanye Le Ng was, was helping to, to lead the way out of, is redefining what freedom looks like. And that maybe includes redefining freedom as requiring uh, liberation and the the current dominant conceptions of freedom unfortunately but predictably have an often invisible carbon basis and this is something that both uh, Audrea and Daniel have written about Audrea you wrote quote six decades after the initial publication of on the road the grip of consumer culture has only tightened on contemporary life and people of all demographics now have the freedom to define themselves through a seemingly endless supply of goods relying on petroleum, cosmetics, fashion, electronics, travel amenities, household goods, Instagrammable meals featuring food products shipped from abroad. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to discuss here, but some initial questions I have are, how do we expose that some of these luxuries are in reality tools of oppression and alienation and what would a new, less carbon-intensive vision of freedom and even pleasure, something that Daniel Adana Cohen likes to write about, look like? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think people, I don't really know how to answer that question, um, partially because I think people, like, People have an amazing adaptability to like whatever is around them and will find ways, I think, to entertain themselves and make friends and whatever based on what's available. And right now that happens to be like Instagram and shopping, uh, online shopping and, you know, and that seems to be like the way that, you know, like people like to entertain ourselves right now. Um, and I think... <sighs> I guess I don't really know how to answer this, but it's like if there was more green space or public space in a city, I could imagine a lot of people would spend more time there and, you know, maybe they would still be looking at their phones sometimes, but they would also be like playing cards or doing, you know, flirting or dancing or, you know, um, and part of that is that we like don't, it's not even, it, so we like disinvested in public infrastructure, but also like public space. Um, and places for people to just be together for that's not that's not uh, structured around consumption. Daniel, your eco-socialist vision, as you laid it out in a recent Jacobin <laughs> article, included vibrators and wine. Um, <laughs> and you're also a big proponent of the idea that we must have a positive future. Often these discussions, at least as they get framed for us in dominant narratives around climate change. Uh, are really about scarcity and the necessity of austerity. But you argue that we have to be talking about abundance. Uh, that's right, yeah. Um, until they come up with a diesel-powered vibrator, I think we can definitely um, support those, you know, electrify everything. Um, so, you know, the, 
I think that what, what's kind of magical about leisure, well, leisure is magical and it feels good, but what makes it possible is something that we know about. So in 1936, millions of French workers went on strike, uh, men and women all over the country, and what they won from Prime Minister Leon Blum, who was, by the way, the Jewish uh, sort of head of state of France that nobody ever told you about in high school, because he, in 1936, under pressure from this workers' movement, head of a new Socialist Party government, mandated two weeks uh, of paid vacation 40-hour work week. Uh, these were historic firsts. Hundreds of thousands of French workers went to the beach for the first time in their lives, piling bicycles onto rail cars, uh, taking them to the beach, also going camping. A huge, massive expansion um, of the kind of concept of everyday life. And in fact, one of the, the most famous banners that workers uh, you know, carried with them during these marches said, life belongs to us. Um, and that's, I think, a very, a very powerful thing. And in a way, we've gotten, we've kind of become trapped into this notion that private consumption is the reward for work. But historically, if you expand leisure time, shorten the work week, and provide the kind of infrastructure that allows for regional low carbon leisure, like bicycle cars on trains, then people are gonna take advantage. So I think we have to kind of reframe it a bit from a moralistic obligation to have low carbon pleasure, to where low carbon pleasure is an easy and morally satisfying reward for like, you know, a good hard day. Like we all, we all deserve this. And, and that story needs to be Told. And I, you know, if you think about New York City, like Coney Island, if you think about like Atlantic City, they're actually, the, the country is, or if you think of these old vacation camps in upstate New York where families used to go, the country is littered with infrastructures for regional leisure for the working class that we now make fun of uh, as being like culturally kind of hilarious rather than celebrating the kind of, you know, physical and social and cultural achievement that if we had more of it right now would actually save us. And they were destroyed by cheap airfare to Florida, basically. And Trump I casinos. Assume. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, but this is an important, this abundance, it really stands in contrast to one dominant narrative, which is like the, li the, the liberal one is that, you know, good, good people drive Priuses and bad people drive SUVs. And the way I think a lot of conservative Americans interpret that then is that being environmentally conscious is, is, is having less and not having what you want. Um, I'm gonna take this to a totally different context, which is sort of the broader hemispheric politics around oil and mining and fossil capital in the Americas. Um, and I think a sort of other positive vision in line with some of the things that have already been said is this idea of buen vivir or living well, which is a vision of abundance. I mean, it's certainly not one of scarcity. Um, it is one of kind of socio-natural harmony um, and, and natural abundance and sort of human pleasure in, in that and human um, cultural activity in relationship to nature. And this is something that's been uh, proposed by indigenous and environmental activists um, in Latin America primarily, but there are kind of parallel, uh, um, parallel uh, worldviews elsewhere in the world as well. Um, and I think it's, it's in some ways very compelling because it, it definitely is a counter to the austerity narrative. Like it's a strongly ecological vision of how to rebalance um, the relationship between humans and nature. Um, but it's one that again kind of has a sort of pleasurable abundant component to it. Um, I think kind of getting back to some of the, the strategic challenges that we were talking about earlier, one difficulty with this narrative is that it's been proposed by um, indigenous environmental activists on the front line, so to speak. It's usually referred to as directly affected communities in Latin America, places that are immediately impacted by oil or mining projects as a sort of counter, you know, counter uh, view to, to the imposition of fossil capital. But it hasn't really taken hold in urban areas as much, aside from like environmental activists in urban areas that like this idea, the sort of masses of low-income people in Latin America probably wouldn't describe themselves as proponents of Buen Vivir, right? It's something that is very rooted in indigenous communities. Um, so that's kind of the challenge of how do you bring this vision of socio-natural abundance and harmony um, out of rural areas um, and out of its connection to specific cultural contexts and broaden it as a view that includes social housing or includes transit or includes green spaces in cities. It, I think it's getting there and there are people on the ground doing this work in Latin America, but using that worldview, um, that positive sort of narrative as a way to bridge rural and urban um, would be, I think, an interesting uh, direction for environmentalism to take in Latin America. Well, a, a follow-up question on that for, for Latin America, but also for, for Africa and much of Asia is, how does the vision for a post-carbon future that we've been discussing speak to the development demands of third world countries that have been pillaged for centuries and that to this day don't have so many basic and critical 
consumption needs met. And in Latin America, as well as, as other places, uh, state and popular control over developing these very natural resources that we need to stop developing ASAP, that has been a cornerstone of democratic, socialist, and anti-imperialist politics. So how, how is that, how should that be addressed, and how do you see it being addressed in Latin America and elsewhere? Right, so in the past decade and a half, um, the sort of recent wave of so-called pink tide governments or left governments, several of which are now out of power or facing serious threats to their power, um, but did have a sustained um, decade to 15 years in power, um, starting with the election of Hugo Chavez um, uh, and continuing through with Correa and Morales and Lula and um, all the rest that we're probably familiar with, um, made sort of resource nationalism a cornerstone of their politics. And in doing so, they weren't kind of inventing something new. They were drawing on a very long history that dates to the early 20th century of popular sector movements demanding national sovereignty over resources such as oil and mining, but also water and land in direct confrontation with foreign capital, who were the owners of, of those um, resources. Um, and so they sort of drew on this long well of kind of um, popular organizing and also actual experiences, um, whether um, um, in Chile or Mexico or elsewhere, of nationalization of those, of those resource sectors, some of which had been then gutted during um, privatization in the neoliberal period. Um, so they kind of put this forward, like we're gonna take back control, we're gonna um, um, take control of oil and mining. Um, and what kind of is interesting about that is the way that then sort of fractured the political terrain on the left in Latin America in so many ways, where at the same time that those governments were promoting kind of a resource nationalist leftism, um, you had this movements that I were refer was referring to earlier, indigenous and environmental movements, pushing back against that with um, radical ecological proposals um, for shifting away from resource dependency. Um, so, you know, that kind of not to sort of blame either side in that conflict, and it's, it's a difficult, it's a kind of tricky story, but the upshot was that the, wet, the left was weakened overall, and there wasn't like a vision of sovereignty, and I think that this needs to be pitched at the regional level, not, not just at the national level, but there wasn't a vision of sovereignty that could be articulated against foreign or international capital, um, but not sort of re-entrench the extractive model. And sort of that kind of got lost in, in the mix. And I'm not sure where that leaves us now, except that in many cases, the right is back in power and we're seeing record levels of oil concessions um, throughout the Americas. Um, and we're gonna see more deforestation and contribution to climate change as a result of that. Um, so I think that formulating some vision of self-determination, of democratic control um, that is anti-imperialist without being extractivist is kind of the challenge for a lot of countries in the left in the in Latin America and the global south yeah. more broadly I, I agree with you completely Thea um, in South Africa uh, the country where I was born a similar kind of struggle has played out you know there's been a recognition around, among particularly progressive sectors of the labor movement um, and social movements that the extractive model isn't working that the country's in deep economic problems particularly given the end of the kind of commodity super cycle that we were in for the last uh, decade and a half or so um, so the price of gold has plunged and the country's in deep crisis now. Um, and there's an attempt to come up with a, an anti-imperialist, non-extractive model. Um, the Alternative Information Development Center has put out a great um, document called the Million Climate Jobs um, Proposal, which is part of a national campaign to have a renewable energy just transition. Um, and so I think that's a very exciting um, set of initiatives and really um, important. I mean, in terms of the original question which you asked, Dan, about um, uh, abundance and the vision of abundance, I think it's really important to remember that over one billion people don't have electricity around the world and that that has um, really heavy effects, particularly on women, you know, who are forced to cook using charcoal stoves and uh, children who suffer really high rates of um, lung disease as a result of this. So, you know, being able to, um, uh, deploy renewable energy to that 1.2 billion people is going to make a tremendous difference and it also, since it would be distributed and decentralized, it also could have quite important kind of democratizing potential. So I, I think, you know, ideally movements would be working in solidarity and supporting those kinds of initiatives in the global south. Um, 
Uh, and I think it's important also to remember that there's a, a proud history um, of fighting a kind of consumer republic model here in the United States and in other developed countries, right? You know, we have critics like Guy Debord who criticize the Society of the Spectacle and movements um, like the Dodge Revolutionary Workers Movement who were fighting for worker control of the assembly line rather than just being able to consume as much as possible. So, you know, while getting wages up and working as much as possible might be kind of the dominant tradition in the labor movement in the United States. It's not the only tradition, and there have been massive uprisings to try and forge a different tradition. And I think it's important to revive those and know that we have those histories to draw on. And I think it's important to remember that uh, it's like hard to overstate how much like U.S., uh, just like Western foreign policy is actually responsible for like stunting the development of countries like in the global south and throughout the world. Like for instance, um, if we're talking about extractive industries, like something like 75% of the mining industries in the world are actually Canadian, or they're based in Canada, you know, like 60% of them are listed on the TSX. So all these like mining companies throughout the world, um, you know, maybe like the local country is getting a little bit of the money, that, but like actually it's the Canadian companies that are getting like the, the lion's share of it. Um, and also if you, you know, even agricultural policy in countries throughout the world um, are, are basically have been like crippled by this uh, system of like global trade we have right now. Or if you even take like Puerto Rico, which is actually in the United States, um, the amount of like, the, it's a tropical island with like incredibly, most of the island is like incredibly fertile farmland. But you know, they export mo most of what they grow on the island um, before the storm anyways. Uh, was for export, and it's like not food that people on the island um, can like eat for themselves. And so, I mean, that if just like, you know, shifting the way that we think about development in these individual countries and how, how it's been shaped uh, over the last few decades by like the global trade system, I mean, I, I, think, that's, I think that's really important. Yeah, that is all really important. It seems like a, a common thread running through that is that older, uh, maybe non-ecologically inclined Marxist forms of analysis like world systems theories might not have had that ecological piece of analysis built in, but it, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to extend this history of underdevelopment and pillage to, to lead to that sort of analysis being included. Um, Ashley, you touched on renewable energy being more decentralized and thus having a greater potential for being democratically controlled. And I wanna talk about the, the material politics of this, of this massive transformation that y'all are arguing has to happen really soon. Um, Timothy Mitchell in Carbon Democracy talks about the different forms, how different forms of carbon extraction and distribution have shaped power relations across space, between nations, and between workers and capitalists. So to break from carbon, we have to transform energy, and to do that, we have to transform the built environment that produces, distributes, and consume, consumes it. And both Ashley and Daniel, you both wrote about how this built environment must include democratically controlled energy systems. And it also has to do things like uh, navigate the, uh, the the politics of putting in windmills and solar farms. Daniel, you talk about how we are going from like drilling down into the earth to spreading out, and that's proven to be quite controversial in a lot of places. And even more controversial, Ashley, according to current projections, New Orleans will one day no longer exist as a city. So there's this incredibly fraught question of retreat, which is people relocating away from rising seas. So. My question is, what does a just reckoning with climate change require in terms of remaking political geography, particularly of cities? Wow, um, thanks for that narrow question. <laughs> Damn. Okay, well, let me say something about the energy and then maybe just a word about, so um, to, to give some sense, to, to, as Ashley was saying earlier, you know, sun and wind, you know, they're variable, okay. Um, to have 90% of U.S. energy by 2050, for 90% of that energy to be come from the wind and the sun, 
the National Renewable Energy Laboratory estimates we would need to double the transmission capacity uh, in the United States, something like 200 million new miles uh, of electric wires. Um, the, the wind farms take up a ton of space too. So to get about 10% of our energy from wind right now would require taking up all the, the, as much space as New Hampshire has. So you know, these things will get more efficient. There's offshore wind, but it's, it's in a massive, massive, massive transformation of the landscape. And the combination especially of wind farms and transmission lines has provoked a ton of opposition. It's probably why the Conservatives are in power in Ontario, where there's a very active group called Mothers Against Wind Turbines. Um, I recommend their Facebook group, it's hilarious. There are something in the order of two to 300 uh, anti-wind groups in the United States uh, right now. So we talk about blockade with fossil fuels, but there is something very similar happening with wind. And if you look at the flyers that are posted on the internet, they use basically the same crappy fonts. Um, so there's a kind of like potential, and I mean, you know, it depends on the location and everything, but there's a potential big upsurge of resistance to this kind of huge rollout of, of landscape transformation. To me, what that says is, okay, one, obviously, yes, we need energy cooperatives, but you're not going to get 100% of that. We also have to think in the scale terms, what does it mean to kind of democratize the economy and democratize the energy system? You know, um, green banks are spreading up all over the country and all over the world, and nobody has come up with a model of how a green bank is run. But we know what credit unions are like. There's a long-standing argument in the left around democratizing finance, turning finance into a public utility. Their campaigns, like the one that Thea is involved with, fantastic campaigns, to kind of re to make utilities public again. And a public institution doesn't have to be like run by the government out of the government's like main head offices. There are other ways. So I think to me, the opportunity of this massive investment in the landscape is to involve local communities in making their own decisions about what kinds of energy infrastructure they want to be a part of, and to think not just the energy cooperative itself, the energy production itself being democratized, but also the financial means by which it's then being democratized, the management of the grid, which is like a massive new complex thing with clean energy, that also has to be democratized. So it's really a moment when institutions that govern our lives are being rapidly transformed, and if the left is on top of this, then that means democratizing like power, literally democratizing power. So that's the huge opportunity, and just saying, oh, wind, solar, move the dials you know, on a simulator, that totally misses what's actually happening here, which is a combination of social, technical transformation where you know, if we're motivated, we can have a massive impact. Um, yeah, your question also is about cities and re-engineering cities, um, and it's undeniable that cities around the world are in big trouble. You know, um, The issue with putting so much carbon into the uh, atmosphere and so much energy into the oceans is that it's a bit like um, you know the Titanic it's very hard to shift its course once it's set on a particular course you know we've got a lot of melting power in the oceans and so we're going to get a lot of sea level rise a lot more impactful storms in cities um, and you know probably about half a billion people having to move away from cities or uh, at least we'll have to retrofit cities where at least half a, uh, half a billion people are living. Um, that means basically all of the coastal cities around the planet are in deep trouble, and some like New Orleans and Miami are just definitely going underwater. So, um, you know, we face real questions about what we're going to do. We're going to have to shift massive populations of people, so we need to start talking about climate refugees both within our country and also internationally, how we can harbor climate refugees since, you know, we are the greatest colonizer of the atmosphere. Uh, after maybe the UK historically because of carbon emissions. Um, but in addition to sort of thinking about ethical and political responsibilities, it's also the possibility to, um, again, think about um, affluence and a good life, right? Because the major problem in the 20th century, um, one of the major issues was that we saw cities as bad, you know, and consequently in the United States we had suburbanization, uh, which leads to massive emissions. That's why the average per capita footprint of Americans is double Europeans, although arguably Europeans have a better quality of life. So cities are um, very minimal impact in terms of um, uh, the carbon footprint of people because it means they can have public transportation. Uh, so there's an opportunity to re-engineer northern American cities to make them um, more uh, uh, filled with amenities, more attractive to people, um, uh, and also to you know, fight forms of galloping gentrification that are displacing people. Um, and of course we need to make sure that the American model of suburbanization is not exported to the rest of the global south, which is what's been happening. 
Yeah, I just want to underline something that um, Daniel brought up and now going away from the urban and back to the to the rural that, you know, we talk about sort of renewable energy in the abstract. We need to add more renewable energy to our sort of energy portfolios, but renewable energy means projects in specific places, right? And so from the perspective of a given rural community, a land-intensive utility scale solar or wind project doesn't feel that different than an extractive, than a mining or oil project. It, it replaces previous land uses. It might threaten livelihoods like agriculture or tourism or whatever else that land was used for previously. So I think it's key to sort of use um, the lessons that we have from the extractive sector and think proactively about how can we get community buy-in and not just buy-in in a sort of like top-down way, but actual community ownership in a cooperative sense or other models um, over the renewable energy sector from the beginning. So it's not like an intrusive extractive thing and we don't have these moms against solar, but that we actually have sort of, you know, we are the local wind people. We provide wind on a distributed grid and that's something to take pride in and have ownership over and that provides jobs. And, you know, there's a positive and democratic way to do it, but it's not the prevailing model at the moment. And the, the specific way that urban greening happens matters a lot because there's a lot of, of, of bullshit when it comes to like the politics of urban sustainability. Uh, the greening a neighborhood can make it ripe for gentrification of course, which is something that a few people here have, have written about I think because the green leisure spaces and just like the aura of sustainability is is seen as something key to attracting and appeasing affluent young workers. Um, if making neighborhoods less lethal to poor residents also exposes them to real estate capital, how should this be done? Okay, um, so you know, actually, also, this, this has to be combined with the question about retreat. So millions, then tens of millions of people in the US by the end of the century will be relocating uh, to where? Um, at the same time, so that's one question. Then, as exactly as you said, Dan, when you essentially improve a place, ecologically or otherwise, its price goes up. Uh, you know, housing prices are going up way faster than wages are. You have now a group of urban planners who use this phrase, just green enough. Their idea is to green neighborhoods, but so subtly that the real estate people don't notice. <laughs> which is like, you know, I don't know, that's just Stockholm Syndrome 101. Um, so <laughs> the thing is just, it's, it's just, if you think about what it means to, to have affordable density, what it means to imagine the gradual relocation of tens of millions of people, you cannot have climate justice, or even really decarbonization and stability and private land markets. It's just not possible. Now, how far and aggressive the intervention into land markets will be, whether it's in the form of like public home building, a la Jeremy Corbyn, a massive expansion of community land trusts. I mean, I think the institutional forums need to proliferate and to vary, but the market governance of land is just not compatible with dealing with this problem. And it, so it has to be transformed. Um, I want to finish by asking a, a few questions about the, the state of the, the discourse and political debate. Audrey, you cite uh, Amitav Ghosh's assertion that inertia, inertia in the face of climate catastrophe is rooted in, quote, the bourgeois belief in the regularity of the world. And that quote struck me because I wonder how that regu what the state of that regularity is at a time when, one, weird weather is becoming the new normal, and also a time when there's this, also what we should make of this liberal commitment, this liberal bourgeois commitment to regularity under Trump, when everything that once seemed so normal to so many appears to be so out of whack, and the new liberal mantra is, is literally, this is not normal. Yeah. Um I mean, when he wrote this book, which was really just published like what, last year? So really not that long ago. Um, and what he's talking about uh, with that phrase is like this idea that um, the, like strange things don't really happen in the world. If they do, they're really out of the ordinary and we can mitigate it and control it. You know? And the grownups will come around and figure it out. Yeah, um, and I kind of increasingly don't think that's the case anymore. I mean, I was, again, just in oil country, I was in Alberta for the last couple weeks, and there's been like massive wildfires happening like across the Rocky Mountains, and 
In the last week, this just like smelled like campfire in Calgary, like which is quite far away from the wildfires. And I, I, you know, I think there's like even people who work in the oil industry. I mean, they believe that climate change is happening. They just also happen to support the oil industry. And I think, so, you know, I think that's starting to shift now. If I can just put on my English professor hat for a second, I'd say that Amitav Ghosh, um, it's important to remember that he's talking about the tradition of the bourgeois novel, and he's essentially dissing speculative fiction, science fiction, and all the other so-called minor genres. But in many ways, it's been those genres that have been most responsive to climate crisis and have thought about speculative futures, possible futures, and possible political realignments um, that we need. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, he's buying into the hierarchies of the literary world too much. And in fact, if you think in a way that's non-hierarchical about the literary world, there's plenty of representation of the irreality, the emergency of the present moment in uh, the literary world, which he discounts. And I would say that Trump himself in um, politics is a response to lack of regularity. You know, he's a response to the evident bankruptcy of um, neoliberal ideology uh, and to the increasingly dire straits which the majority of people find, uh, in the United States find themselves. And you can say the same thing for uh, populist strongmen in many other countries around the world. Um, and, you know, so I think we really see with a figure like Trump that we're going to have uh, a state of barbarism or we're going to have uh, socialist responses to the crises of neoliberalism and the climate crisis. And the ecological crisis is obviously already here as an ecological crisis, but is it already manifest as a political crisis? I mean, I think that I mean, that's a great question, and I think the answer is kind of ha halfway. Um, you know, I made reference to the in Ontario, a sort of Trump-esque figure, Doug Ford, has just been elected premier. So Ontario is like the fifth most important economy in North America, um, maybe the third most active on climate change, along with uh, you know New York State and California, and arguably the things that got Doug Ford elected all had to do with uh, climate change. So there was a, a scandal when the Liberal government of Ontario. Uh, decided a, a little over a decade ago to shut down all of its coal plants right away. It had to replace that power. It decided it would build a couple of natural gas plants. There was community opposition. They canceled the contract. It cost hundreds of millions of dollars. They built very aggressively wind turbines, set up to build wind turbines all across the province with basically like sweetheart contracts to big companies like Samsung, where they basically wanted to kind of ram it down. And this caused a huge amount of rural opposition. And finally, to raise money for their social spending, they privatized Hydro One, which was the major public utility. And people were really pissed off about that. Now, Ontario won't have experienced this recent election as a climate election, but really the major political issues were the issues of the energy transition. Um, and if you look at you know, uh, Brazil, which was really convulsed by these protests in 2013, which the right took advantage of, it's really the result of a contradiction between, on the one hand, the left government investing in home building and car purchases to stimulate the economy and to supposedly increase the quality of workers' lives. But what this really does is causes a massive urban crisis because you have gigantic housing towers in the middle of nowhere and you have cities uh, clogged by cars and the kind of crisis in the quality of life and this completely contradictory politics of consumption in everyday life of, of people. So I think that what we're seeing is not necessarily people recognizing the crises that they're living through as, uh, as climate crises, or we could speak about Trump and the coal workers, but what we're seeing is a kind of blending of the two together. And you know, I would pitch in terms of fiction like um, uh, New York's uh, New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson, which is really about this intertidal idea, you know, Manhattan's half underwater, but it's sort of the book about flux and ambivalence and the, the way that politics is ultimately going to decide between catastrophe versus, you know, doing better. Um, and I'd pitch the fiction of Jasmine Ward uh, and the memoir of Jasmine Ward. She's a, you know, a writer, a black writer. She lives in the south of the U.S. near the, the Gulf of Mexico. And it's, you know, her book... Um, I'm forgetting the, the name, Salvage the Bones, is essentially a book about Katrina. It's a book about climate change. She retweets Michael Mann, like the second most famous climate scientist on Twitter. But climate change is never mentioned in this book, but it's a book about heat and sweat kind of taking over everyday life and ecological catastrophe. And so I think when we think about storytelling, it ha can't just be about green jobs, but it's really an integrative concept of like, what is the story of our times? Where are people's material interests in them? And how do we fold climate in in a way that's not, this is the thing that will shape your future only. That's cool for some of us. But like that narrative blend, and that's, you know, that's a real challenge, but I think we're up for it. Thea, do, does the demise of the pink tide in Latin America, at least the first iteration of it, is that something that you would describe as a climate crisis or just merely an energy crisis? 
Um, I mean, I would certainly attribute the sort of like domino of like failing left governments or the declining electoral uh, success of the left in Latin America as deeply tied to the extractive model of development. I don't think there's any other way to explain the sort of correlation and timing of multiple governments um, being unable to win re-election or being uh, victims of right-wing forces that in previous years uh, they would have had more popular defense against um, without understanding um, the, the change changing global commodity markets, which are certainly have a important climate dimension in a variety of ways. So I guess I would say, um, yes, I mean, basically the, what happened with the end of the commodity boom and, and uh, Ashley referred to the end of the commodity super cycle earlier. The reason it's a super cycle, it's because it was the lo long, one of the longest ever sustained high prices for commodities across many different commodity sectors, agricultural, renewable, non-renewable, and this was in large part driven by Chinese demand and um, uh, a number of emerging industrial economies, but China foremost among them. And with the demise of, or with the decline of prices, um, in uh, 2014, depending when you date it, um, these left-wing governments really had no more fiscal resources. They had sort of tied their political economic fate so closely to the con continuity of extraction um, and sort of built a resource nationalist vision around this um, to support them politically. Um, and it had levels of political support for good reason. They were able to fund a huge expanses in uh, social services and public works projects. But when that ended, um, there was nothing to replace that. There was really no transition. Speaking, you know, we talk about a post-carbon transition, but in Latin America, it's talked about as the post-extractive transition. And there was really no transition sort of um, put into place for when that was inevitably going to end. Um, and so, um, there are many reasons that we can talk about in each case, but I would say that the demise of the electoral left, recent demise of the electoral left in Latin America is inextricable from the end of, um, from the extractive model and the end of the commodity boom. I would just say the place that I think you can see the ways in which um, political crises are already climate crises most clearly is in the EU and the relation between uh, the kind of crack up of the EU around the question of immigrants and uh, the conflict in Syria. Um, now, multiple things were happening in Syria, but there's been a lot of scholarship to show that it started from a really significant drought, which pushed people out of rural areas to cities, which then, you know, where there were these demonstrations with the Assad regime then cracking down and militarizing the conflict and, met, you know, many millions of refugees leaving. Um, and, and so we see the breakup of the idea of open borders and the rise of neo fascist movements um, in uh, Europe as a result of kind of reaction against these immigrants and the ways that the EU doesn't have a viable model for resettling immigrants. Um, so I think this is one of the clearest ways in which an environmental crisis is leading to the real breakup of a significant political formation and to the rise of neo-fascism um, in particular European countries. And, you know, it's hard to say the extent to which immigrants to the United States are being driven by a similar kind of concatenation of factors, but um, from Central America and other places, but I don't think we can rule out climate crises in places like Honduras. You know, there's the impact of neoliberalism and of political oppression, but increasingly there's also climate crisis driving folks to come to the United States. Um, my, my last question to close things out is just like, where do things stand now? To what degree is the left having some sort of impact on climate politics? And to what extent are we in a situation where the debate is dominated by right-wing, fossil fuel-funded denialists on the one hand and neoliberal technocrats on the other? And what can we do to change that? I'm gonna just answer that question going back to Latin America um, and not even though you're asking, I think you're just asking about the US no, perhaps. No, wherever. Okay, whatever. All places. Um, and, and something that uh, kind of was relevant a little earlier in the conversation but I think speaks to this question as well is um, the, the frontline community strategy that we talked about earlier um, uh, that, that sort of centers on communities that are directly impacted by mining oil, but also by um, mega development projects that have their own environmental repercussions, including deforestation, and are therefore quite relevant to climate change. Um, I, I want to note that on the one hand, this strategy has been incredibly successful. Um, 
scholars of the region have noted like a big uptick in local level conflict. And what local level conflict means is communities actually doing work to stall mining and oil projects. And this is a really important thing. We have to keep it all on the ground, right? We have to keep the oil on the ground. We have to keep the coal on the ground. We have to also not do large scale mountaintop removal if we're going to make any headway um, regarding climate change. So I think there's a lot of success there. And I also think there's a lot of really inspiring visions that I kind of mentioned earlier around what an alternative political political economy and political ecology might look like. I think the, the challenge though, and speaking directly to your question about the left, is that this has occurred and in some ways exacerbated, and I'm not blaming the frontline communities for this, it, it's a broader political context um, of multiple dynamics, but it has sort of split the left in Latin America on the question of extraction and not left a sort of coherent left strategy about what do we do both in the frontline communities and in communities that aren't tech, you know, sort of in a traditional sense, frontline communities. What do we do about urban areas um, and the sort of masses of, of people? Um, so I think that in some ways there's been tremendous headway made um, to bring environmental issues to the fore of national and regional politics in the Americas, but in other ways there's sort of a strategic impasse and now with the rise of the new right, which Ashley was referring to in a sort of global sense, but is certainly salient in, in the Americas as well, um, it's unclear kind of what direction things will take. Um, okay, um, I would say that there are two countries on one timeline that really matter right now, matter more than the rest. So the common timeline is like 2050, that's what all our targets are for. But 2050 is like so impossibly far away right now, even though it is um, barely, uh, barely 30 years away, but it's irrelevant. It's like five to 10 years is the timeline where you need to really bend emissions. And if you do, you can avoid all the worst impacts of climate change and things can be pretty great. Um, so. All the, the sort of a lot of theoretical debates about what kind of energy mix is optimal for 2040 and just throw it out. The question is, what do you get to very quickly? Okay, the two countries are obviously China and the United States. Um, until the mid 2000s, both were seen as problems, the United States primarily, then as the US with Obama's election, but really starting in 06 with the democratic wave, there came this idea that the US would get its act together, but China would be the problem. Now it's clear that China compared to any other major like gigantic economy is investing heavily in climate you know, friendly and, and renewable energies. Of course it's not enough, but it still has sort of turned the corner. And the US is the problem, but if you look at, again, what I was saying, in 2020, it is extremely likely that the democratic presidential nominee will have a jobs, climate and infrastructure plan that are pretty well connected. Um, the two best ones last time were O'Malley, Sanders less good, Clinton's the worst. Um, I don't think we're gonna get Clinton's against. It seems to me pretty <laughs> likely that we're gonna get something closer to O'Malley, Sanders, or better. Um, if you look at New York City, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has an amazing climate justice plan. She gets it, um, Julia Salazar gets it. The entire sort of left, as Kate Aronoff, who's here, has written about the kind of new left in the Democratic Party is very, very strong on climate change. So every kind of, every direction points to defeating Trump is the same as having a far more visionary energy, climate, social policy in the US than has ever been the case. And it probably has been possible for decades because the role of the state was being attacked in a way that now is possible to turn around. So to me, it's like an extremely optimistic moment. We could go from 10 years ago when it looked like no major economy was tackling this to in five years from now, where the two most important economies are, are going full on on this probably encouraging each other and sort of shifting the whole landscape of what is possible in the world. I'm extremely optimistic. Um, there's like a lot of work to do, but I find like zero reasons to like cry about climate change. There are a million other issues that seem to me far darker and more despair inducing than climate change right now. Um, just to say yes, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there are also many other places we can look to besides China and the US. They're clearly hugely important. There's really interesting movement in both places. But um, you know, there are also other really important models to look at, um, you know, including in the past Germany and the way that it's helped to create um, cooperatives and the way in which there's a very strong municipalization movement. Um, and the UK and uh, Jeremy Corbyn's platform in labor to nationalize the energy sector. So, you agreed, know, agreed, in some agreed. places where fossil capitalism is not quite as strong, it's also possible to make pretty significant changes that can then also feed back into the visions which folks have in places like the US. Yeah, I mean, German feed-in tariffs built up the Chinese solar industry, yes. right? German consumers Absolutely. paid for it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but I agree with you, Corbin, that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, there's still, o the oil industry is, like, really, really strong in the U.S. right now. It's booming and it's growing because of shale oil. Like, we, we just can't forget 
that. And that's why it is really important to like keep supporting the frontline communities yeah. that are fighting pipelines and like refineries and whatever. Um, and you know, it's also the case in Canada where you know the, the prime minister is coming in and like bailing out a really controversial and unpopular pipeline. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of models to look at abroad as well as you know, there's like cases of uh, municipalization like within the United States or you know, we, we like need to look more closely at like what California is doing and seeing like how that can be applied in other states as well. And I think, yeah, it is really important to just, um, like I said before, like, you know, meet people where their concerns are at and like use that as a, a mobilizing tool. Um, like use, use that as a starting point to talk about something like a Green New Deal or, you know, a broader shift. Um, and I think that like a, there's been a lot of movement on that in even just like the past year, it's like, you know, the climate movement is like massively different now mm -hmm. than it was like two years ago. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm also optimistic. Well, on that optimistic note, Adria Lim, Ashley Dawson, Daniel Adana-Cohen, and Theoria Francos, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.